project involving many professors in the department, he thrust his pro proposal that he had submitted to DARPA, I think, and said, hey, Mohan, you'd be a great guy for this. Please come and join me. And I felt at that point, uh, once I took it up and interacted with him and found that he wasn't all that knowledgeable about anything and he was more a wheeler dealer and a manager rather than a real hardcore technical person, uh, I had this Indian mentality, oh, he has supported me, so I can't just say, you know, get lost and move on to another professor. So I stuck with him. Luckily for me, at one point he said he wanted to move off to University of Maryland. He was hoping that he could take all his students there. And I thought this was a nice way of saying goodbye to him. So that's when I started working for uh, Chandi and Mishra. And they were in totally different space. They, they were into verifiable programs and distributed simulation and such topics. While they were good, unfortunately, they were not that good with making sure the students got good thesis topics and they extract, extracted more out of the students in terms of what they ultimately said was good and good enough work for the PhD. Some of the people that did their PhDs under them, they got away with murder in terms of how much real work they did. So I was very unhappy because I was trying to do something in the area of um, um, exception handling and distributed programs and so on. And um, I was not making enough of a progress. Uh, so I thought at that point, maybe, you know, if I were to uh, go abroad, meaning not necessarily go abroad, go to some uh, industrial lab or some such thing and try to uh, do a summer job, I might get some ideas for a thesis topic. But unfortunately, at the time, I tried the summer of 79. This is the second summer, right? I went there in fall of 77. Um, OK, finally, we are somewhat there. Um, this professor refused to give me a, a letter saying, he won't support me during the summer so that I can get the work permit to be able to work during the summer. Let me see. I have to locate the presentation. I'm picking up one version which may not be the one with the right title, but that's OK. It's taking so long. It's a small file, actually. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, this got some in interesting things at the beginning that I won't get into right now. Uh, I just wanted you to know, um, I launched into the other part before. I've always believed in straight talk, no beating around the bush kind of stuff. So, um, And I grew up in a different place and time. US research environment was very different as well as inside and outside IBM. I was giving this particular version of the presentation to IBMers, new employees of IBM. Um, and I had seen the good times and the bad times, meaning IBM was on the verge of bankruptcy in the early 90s. Uh, while revenue was good, the cash flow was bad. The profits were next to nothing. So uh, that's when we, for the first time, hired an outside uh, guy as the CEO. Lou Gerstner came from Nabisco and um, uh, he did chopping and this and that. So from 400,000 employees or so, we went down to 225,000. Before he came, the previous CEO was on the verge of actually splitting IBM into multiple companies, just like the Big Bell went into uh, Little Bells, AT&T. Um, but the first thing that Lou decided to do was to uh, say that uh, IBM staying as a single company is good for the customers and so on, single stop shopping and such. So he said, forget this whole business of splitting IBM. Um, and so then subsequently, of course, you know, he did all sorts of restructuring and got big time into services arena and such. Uh, got out of low margin businesses. That's why we sold uh, I may not get the timing right, but in, you know, we got out of the DRAM memory business, we got out of flat panel displays, we got out of printers, we got out of uh, desktop uh, and uh, PCs, laptops and so on. We sold it to Lenovo. We got out of uh, hardware disk drive business. But we got into a number of other businesses, right? We did a lot of acquisitions. We expanded like crazy in countries like India. 
Uh, we probably have more than 100,000 employees in India now. Um, IBM doesn't announce exact numbers. Um, and we are now at, I think, 425,000 employees or so. We are a $100 billion revenue company. We just uh, last year completed 100 years of our existence. So we are a little younger than Indian Institute of Science, which celebrated its centenary in December 2008. Um, and we emphasize more the high margin businesses. That's why we went and acquired um, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers consulting business, uh, which became BCS in IBM. Um, um, what else do I want to say? You know, economy and luxury lifestyles. I'm not looking for, you know, boats and such. I want a decent lifestyle. So money making is by itself not what I was particularly excited about. Decent amount of money is needed, but beyond that, you know, I'm not looking for overnight millions. This is all to tell you why I went in for long-term technical career. I've been in IBM 31 years, half the time as an IBM fellow, which means I'm an IBM exec during that period, since uh, June 2000, June 1997. Um, but I've never been a manager. So in all these 31 years, I've never had people management or money management responsibilities. Um, even though I had all this fancy title of IBM India chief scientist and so on, I didn't actually have anybody reporting to me. Um, and so yeah, I came to India, that chief scientist thing that's mentioned there. Um, old guy, <laughs> now I'm 57, that says 55. Um, and while I uh, was at IBM, um, in the initial stages as I was getting excited about all my research work and um, trying to solve problems that some people had not just some people, some important people had declared as unsolvable and things like that. Uh, and it was not a fashionable topic. I chose to dig my nose into it and look at things with a different perspective because I wasn't there when these other guys, Jim Gray, I don't know how many of you have heard of him. He's the guy who disappeared in the Pacific Ocean, a Turing Award winner. He used to be in my lab. A year before I joined, he left IBM Research to go to Tandem and then to Digital and then to Microsoft. Um, there was a, an article about his di disappearance in the Wired magazine. Just go Google Wired Jim Gray and you'll see all the Ramayan there. Very smart guy. Uh, he and others who had been there in the system R days during the you know tail end of uh, this original relational database project at IBM Research, uh, they had declared that fine granularity locking in the database arena was something that they couldn't uh, figure out how to do with a certain recovery technology. Um, I do care a lot about my image in terms of not, you know, whether I look good or whatever, but uh, in terms of my research uh, uh, persona, um, both inside and I, outside IBM. By research, I don't mean just writing papers and going to conferences and, you know, proving theorems and this and that, but actually having an impact on the real world in terms of technology transfer and things like that. Uh, but not just doing that alone though. Still being thought of as uh, somebody who makes a difference in the research community outside IBM too, getting awards outside as was mentioned. Um, and so uh, that brings luster not only to the organization, but you know, you contribute to the community, you leave behind a legacy that's not just, you know, houses and boats and money in the bank, but also stuff that gets into textbooks and things like that. So some of you may or may not know about this Aries recovery technology that's now part of a lot of textbooks and uh, is required reading for PhD courses and so on, uh, PhD qualifiers and such. Um, so the point is, given my background, how I grew up and this and that, what I managed to do uh, may or may not be something that you will be able to do or want to do or whatever. So take all of this with a bag of salt. Um, so some of this I've already covered. Um, so even as a B.Tech chemical guy, I, that computer club that existed here, which um, was a way for the non-computer science formal people to 
learned to program, which was like, you know, uh, one hour a week or something they used to have. After a while, I got, you know, impatient with that pace. So I said, let me do my own thing. So I started reading manuals and trying to learn different programming languages and so on. Um, so I've already mentioned a lot of these things. So one thing I did which helped me, um, I was reading a lot of papers and I wrote this critique on a particular system that a bunch of people from Harvard and Computer Corporation of America, which was a small outfit in Boston area, which relied a lot on DARPA funding and so on to do some advanced technology work. They built a system called SGD-1, a distributed database system, and they made all sorts of tall claims and how revolutionary it was, blah, blah, blah. And I looked at it and I, I found all sorts of problems with it. I went beyond the hype and the fancy papers they wrote and published, and, you know. This is people like Papadimitriou and Phil Bernstein, lots of big name people. Those of you who know something about the area may appreciate these names. But um, I wrote this critique and I tried to get it published. And these guys were powerful enough, they said, oh, this is not a research paper, it's more a critique rather than a, you know, new algorithms kind of paper. So they made sure it didn't appear in VLDB conference and things like that. But I made sure. I shout it under the nose of everybody who, who I thought might be interested in it or should be interested in it. So the point with that is, don't sit in your corner and do quote unquote good work and think that glory will come to you automatically. This Indian mentality that you shouldn't seek glory or publicize your thing, that's even in my age was already bad thinking. And now in this even more uh, modern age of web and this and that with information overload, even if somebody wants to track all the good work that's going on on their own, there is so much going on that they may not be able to distinguish the good from the bad and may not have the, you know, may not have the time to do that. And so you as the guy who did the work, if you really want to you know, have impact, you have to take the trouble to market your work. So you may be a hardcore techie who doesn't ever want to become a manager like I was, but that doesn't take it, take it away from you the responsibility of uh, having to um, sell your idea, okay? Um, so that's something where I found people not doing enough of that. It was also like the hacker culture, right? People do a lot of programming, cutesy thing and all that. They might demo it, but they don't document it. And so they think they've built something fancy, but it's only when they document, they may even realize that it's full of holes. And it will also give an opportunity for other people to stare at it and make, try to make sense of what you have done. So it helps in many ways to document your work in a reasonable fashion. Even if you don't want to get papers published, just to get the conceptual idea straightened out and for legacy in terms of helping the people who later on have to deal with the mess you created, extend the product, whatever it is, right, algorithm, whatever. Um, it's important to spend some time doing that. All this excuse about I'm too busy to document is all BS. Because ultimately, you need to do that other thing also to do a more complete job. And so if you do all that, then it can actually come in handy. So in this case, what happened, even though my thesis work ultimately, and I'll get to how I did that, was not uh, practical at all, and it was just papers and no prototype was built and so on. The fact that I wrote this paper even though it didn't get published, but I made sure a lot of important people got to know, including this Jim Gray and people like that, helped me in getting a job and my name came to be known. However, grudgingly they might have said, oh, this guy knows something, even though I don't want it published, I, I, I can see that he's a smart ass guy. That sort of thing helped in name recognition and so on, and subsequently being asked to serve on program committees and things of that nature. Uh, so that controversial thing, was something that was a good thing. So even when I was interviewing an IBM research guys in San Jose said, hey, what is this? This is all very impractical stuff, this non two face locking, uh, you aren't even implemented anything. So I said, look, I had to do something to show some intellectual thing. If you want me to find fault with it, I can give you a long list of things. And by the way, if you want to test the practical side of me,